My name is Paul Zweer and I'm here to give you some suggestions and some thoughts about cross-examination. I imagine as you're preparing at this point before you go off to the firms or law offices and doing your, uh, your demonstration and workshop cross-examinations, you're thinking back to the My Cousin Vinny uh, lecture that we talked about before and you may have some notion about the fun that we saw in watching uh, uh, the, my cousin Vinny do his cross-examinations, but now as you're getting closer to actually having to do it yourself, I thought I might give you some suggestions and some tips about how it is to think about cross-examination. And so what I thought first of all to do is to tell you about and give you some thoughts about point selection, then talk to you about some technique issues, and then give you an example of how it is that you might put a cross-examination together. So let me start with some suggestions to you about how it is that you might think about where do you get your points for cross-examination. First of all, the, the lesson comes from a, a famous trial judge and trial lawyer, Irving Younger, who used to say that you cross-examine only to the extent necessary to make the points that you need to make your closing argument. Now the theory is then that you're thinking about your closing argument first before you craft your cross-examination. So you would, for example, look at Officer Sliviak if you were the defendant and you'd ask yourself, now, what is it that I want to say about Officer Sliviak? What do I want to say about my theory of the case? And how does that help me select the types of topics that I might want to use when I cross-examine Sliviak? So when you're thinking about your closing argument, you remember that you've got some basic choices. First, the first choice is you say to yourself, well, I think I'm going to go and establish that the police were really sloppy in their police procedure. This is a rush to judgment case, and so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to show that what happened in this case is that the police were sloppy, they didn't take the time, they didn't follow the necessary leads that they needed to follow, and so in order to be able to make that point on closing argument, to make those points on closing argument, I need to demonstrate that in the way that I conduct the cross-examination of Officer Sliviak. Now, when you're thinking about, well, well, can I make those points? Can I figure out a way to go ahead and make Officer Sliviak say the things that I need him to say? You have to consider the sources that you have for the facts that are going to constitute some of the questions that you're going to ask. Because as you remember from the My Cousin Vinny, the, the technique of cross-examination is to make a series of short statements, one fact per question statements, in an organized fashion that leads the jury to a particular conclusion. So where do you get those facts? Well, obviously, first of all, you get those facts from the witness statements that uh, you have uh, that record what it is that Officer Sliviak said he did on that night. So you've got police reports, you've got transcripts of what it is that he said at the first trial, and you can then comb those for the specific facts that allows you to go ahead and ask the specific questions and control what his answers are going to be. The reason for that is, is that when you're talking about a safe cross-examination, what you're trying to do is to ask things that if the officer would disagree with you about, you would be able to go to then those sources and you would say, well, isn't it say in your police report that particular fact? You would say, well, doesn't it say in this transcript, this sworn testimony, that that's the fact? You control then by by sourcing your facts in as high a level of uh, authenticity and reliability as you can. You're trying to make sure that the facts that you're putting to the officer are facts that you can prove in case there's a disagreement between the two of you. Now some of the facts that you're going to use also to make some suggestions are not going to be things that are going to be said specifically in a transcript a sworn transcript of some sort, or in some of the documents or some of the exhibits in the case. But they're going to come really more out of common sense and logic. The more that you move away from very highly resourced facts and into the area of common sense and logic, the more that you're risking that the officer is going to have other ways of seeing it, other perspectives. It's going to get in trouble. So when you move off from 
a transcript, a sworn transcript, and you move into the area of common sense, recognize that as you walk that way, you're starting to fly on the trapeze of cross-examination without a net. Uh, there isn't a place to go if he quarrels with the logic or if your logic is not airtight. So, you source your facts, you try to figure out what your points are, you source those facts and gather those facts that are consistent with the particular point that you want to make, and then you say to yourself, do I really need to do this cross with this witness? Or is there a safer witness, a, sif a safer place for me to be able to make these points? Is this the witness that's necessary for me to be able to get these facts from? And so if there's another police officer that really makes that point better, is there another witness that makes that point better? You can resist the, the temptation to make a quarrel with every witness over every point, bore the jury, and lose the jury in the process. A rule of thumb is to not cross-examine a witness if you can first establish the facts through a direct examination of some witness who you can control and prepare. Don't cross-examine a witness on a point where you're only using logic and common sense and you don't have a resource to back it up. And before you cross-examine, always ask yourself, is it necessary? Or do I have the facts in the record already and can I in fact say, with some degree of drama, I have no questions for this witness. And the argument is, is that the officer really did not help the prosecution's case because this officer really didn't say anything of consequence. So those are some of the factors you look at when you're trying to make a determination of which points you're going to select. Now let's talk a few words about technique and how it is that you craft cross-examination questions in order to be able to maximize control. In order to do that, let me remind you of three basic types of questions. You remember that on direct examination, we talked about these questions as being the questions which most establish the credibility of the witnesses. Who, what, how, why, describe, explain. That those are the kinds of questions which allow the witness to talk and therefore allow the witness to establish the witness's credibility. Those questions are, though, questions where you're giving up the control. You're giving up the control to the witness to pick the right words, to pick the right emphasis, to pick the right tone, and therefore, the control on direct examination comes more from the headings that you put over the top of the witness. So I imagine you're going to see on a direct examination of Officer Sliviak questions that are now, Officer Sliviak, I want to talk to you about what the scene looked like. Tell us. Tell us how far it was from your car to the front door. What did the front porch of the house look like? And so you set a heading, and then you ask a series of open-ended questions. What, how, why, describe, explain to us what the landscaping looked like. And those questions give up, then, to the witness the control to speak. Now, we talked about, remember, on direct examination, a mid-level set of questions. These questions start often with verbs, for example, They start with did, is, was, are. Are you the officer who interviewed Ms. Thompson? Are you the officer who went to the boarding house after you examined the scene? Did you ask any questions of Ms. Thompson about her and her relationship with her daughter. Those questions are questions which typically can be answered yes or no. Now I describe these as mid-level questions because they're questions that while answering yes or no have a bit of curiosity in them. They might be leading questions but they potentially could 
be questions which are answered, in fact, no. And part of what you're doing when you ask open ended, or not these mid level questions, is you're saying things that invite the witness to respond in some way. So these questions have a little bit more risk than the third section of questions we're going to talk about. They're less risky because they really have asked for a much narrower piece of information, but they still have some risk because they're in the form of a question. Now the third kind of question is the question which has a noun verb format to it. You did this. This happened next. This is a fact that you can't deny. These questions, you might say to me, are not really questions. They look like they're statements. The question really comes because of the context or the setting in which those questions are being asked. And so you say, Officer Sliviak, Officer Sliviak, you were the officer responsible for conducting the investigation of the death of Le into the death of Leslie Mitchell. You were the person responsible. And you pause and you look at Officer Sliviak and you wait for Officer Sliviak to answer that question. Now I want you to know that you may be in settings where some lawyers will object to that. They will say, counsel's making a speech. And so if you are in a courtroom where the judge entertains that objection, and I would say to you they shouldn't entertain that objection, they should understand that of course what's implied by that statement is, is that right, is that correct? But if you're in a court where the court says sustained to an objection that you're making a speech, well then add some of those words that I just raised to, your, to the noun verb formats. Officer Sliviak, you arrived at 10.15 in the evening. Is that right? Correct? True? And your statement at the end, correct or true, should satisfy even a judge who is requiring you to put a question on it. Now, let me show you that those are then what? Those are most controlling kinds of questions. They're putting words, in effect, into the mouth of the witness. They're putting those words that you have selected, right, because you have, in fact, gleaned them from the trial transcripts or from the police reports, so you know that those facts are true. And the purpose of these very short one-fact question is to put words into the brains, the minds of the jurors in that case. So, the technique that we would suggest to you to use and develop is to use only third level questions. Noun verb in format. Third level questions, noun verb in format, in order to be able to maximize the control that you exercise over the officer and in order to be able to keep the officer focused on the facts that you want the jury focused on. Now notice a couple of features about the technique that's used. Now first, think about the structure of the courtroom. If the jury is here, and the witness is here, and you are here, then what you have is, as a cross-examining lawyer, is you are center stage. And if what happens is that you move on direct over here in order for the witness to be center stage, that on cross you want to stay in the well, in the middle of the courtroom, so you can position yourself to be the center of attention. Your eye contact then has this kind of triangle to it. When you ask the question, your eyes are focused on 
the witness, Officer Sliviak. Officer Sliviak, you were responsible for the investigation of Leslie Mitchell's death. And you look directly into the eyes of the witness while you ask that question to maximize the control. At the same time, though, you want to make sure that the communication is with the jury. And you arrived at the scene at 10.15. Your entire investigation that night was concluded by 10.30. When you left, and here it seems to me, you look at the jury. When you left the Thompson residence and went to the boarding house. So your technique is to really be talking to the jury as you're asking the questions. You also want to, as you're talking to the jury, you want to make sure that they are with you. They get it. They get the point that you're making. And here are a couple of what may sound like contradictory principles. The first is Save the conclusion for closing. If your point is that the police officers rush to judgment, then what you want to do is you've got to realize that if you say, well, Officer Sliviak, isn't it true that you'd already made up your mind when you left the scene of the Thompson residence and went to the boarding house? You'd already determined in your head who the guilty person was. He would, of course, say what? No, I hadn't already concluded. I still had an open mind. I still had a whole lot more to investigate. And so the principle on closing is to save the conclusion for closing so that the officer doesn't have a chance to rearrange his best points in a way that allows him to go ahead and take the point that you've made. Well, if that's a principle, then what are you doing on closing? My suggestion to you is that what you're doing is you want to announce by a heading, the topic of your point. The topic of your point. And then stack your facts. And stop just short of your conclusion. Let me give you an example. All right? Officer Sliviak, I want to talk to you about the time that you took to investigate the scene and to interview the witnesses. All right? Now, Officer Sliviak, you arrived at the scene at 10.15. You arrived with your partner and you secured the scene. Is that right? You called an ambulance. And your investigation was complete on that night at 10.30. Isn't that right? That's what you told us? 10.30 was the time you left and went to the boarding house? Now, you didn't call other police officers to go to that boarding house to arrest Joe Mitchell. You didn't call for backup, did you, to investigate the scene? You didn't ask for police officers to interview other witnesses? Your discussions with witnesses concluded at 10.30 when you made your way to the boarding house. The theory of this technique is to announce your heading with your topic, to stack the facts that lead to your conclusion, and then to stop short, one question short of the conclusion, hoping that the jury says, hmm, sounds like to me they'd already made up their minds and they were 
in a hurry. They were in a rush off without having looked for other kinds of evidence of bullets being fired, well, other kinds of evidence about whether or not, in fact, Ms. Thompson herself might have been the shooter, and that, in fact, he'd already concluded in his mind, because otherwise he certainly would have considered further conversations with Ms. Thompson about things like her financial interest in the case, whether or not, in fact, she got along with Joe Mitchell, whether she had an ax to grind of some sort. And so the technique is to announce the topic, stack the facts, and stop short of the conclusion, and let the silence be the place where the jury reaches the conclusion for themselves as to what it is that they're looking to do. All right, so that's the technique of cross-examination on a per-point basis. How do you put a full cross-examination together? Well, here's what you need to do. What you need to do is to say to yourself, what are the points, again, that I need in order to be able to have the, the stuff I need for my closing argument? And what are those points that I need from Officer Sliviak? And so you might say, well, here are some points I might want to make. Short time at the scene. Failure to investigate Thompson adequately. Joe's cooperation at boarding house. Remember, he hands the gun over to the officers. Joe's shock at hearing Leslie's death. If those are all your points, then what you're doing is to use this technique with each one of those points. What you're trying to do is to take the specific facts that back up that point and stack them underneath a heading that describes that point. Once you have gathered then all the facts, some of the facts are common sense perhaps, some of the facts are logic, some of the facts are things that you failed to do as opposed to things that she, he said that he did, and you stack those groups of facts under each one of these points, then the question is, how do you arrange the points in a way that maximizes the control on the cross? Well, there are a couple of principles of putting your cross all together once you've selected the points that you want to make. One principle is the primacy and recency. That is, to start with your best point and end with your second best point. The theory of this organizational principle is to say that jurors remember best what they hear first. And they remember second best what they hear last. And so if they're going to remember most about your cross, what you want them to remember is the point that you start with and the point that you finish with. In between, you might take a little more chances knowing that you've got a good, strong point to end on, one that has maximum control. And so an organizational uh, principle could be primacy and recency, with some little more chances taken in between. Or what you could do is to try a principle of soft to hard. The theory of this principle in putting your cross-examination together is to say you can start out by getting areas of agreement with a witness so that you can agree as Officer Sliviak that there are things that they're supposed to be doing. That in fact, they have to keep an open mind. That as an officer, that's a tough job. That one of the most difficult things is to not pollute a crime scene at the same time that you're investigating it. And so you might empathize with Officer Sloviak. You might talk to him about police work in areas where in fact he feels like you're agreeing with him. Making a series of points about all the choices that he's making and his responsibility to control these things. And then move more into your attack mode, those things that he didn't do, that his failure to call forensics, that his failure to be able to call backup to go ahead and go to the scene, his failure to go ahead and track down other witnesses, to try to investigate other people that might have been involved, 
that those failures are failures that are now more in the attack mode and are the kinds of things that you would move to after you have set a standard or a set of agreeing principles to measure his conduct. So the organizational principle of this is from soft to hard, from areas of agreement to areas of disagreement, and you're looking as you're structuring your points in order to be able to tell this story in a way where you're getting some more cooperation from the witness. Once you go on the attack, once you call the officer a liar, once you say that the officer was rushing to judgment, you've called him incompetent, and the theory is, is that then he's not going to cooperate with you in other areas. Finally, you might say to yourself, well, how am I going to talk about Officer Sliviak when I close? What's going to be my most persuasive arguments about the points I need to make about Officer Sliviak? Where he found the bullet, his failure to take more care in his identification, his understanding of where the bullet mark was on the doorpost. And you say to yourself, how am I going to talk about that and the failure of that and the explanation for that, and how am I going to organize that in the most persuasive way? And then try to use that same set of principles of persuasion to organize the points you're going to make in cross so that there is a match between what you did on cross-examination and what it is that you do as you're organizing your points on cross. Now, let me give you one last bit of advice about cross-examination. It's easy for me to tell you that you should save your conclusions for the jury. It's very easy for me to tell you that you shouldn't quarrel with the witness, that you can get more by being tight with your questions, one fact per question questions, than going ahead and quarreling and putting in all your arguments together. It's easy for me to say that it's much harder to do it, especially in the heat of battle. And so let me say to you that if, in fact, you find yourself asking too much in your questions or starting to quarrel with the witness, that you remember these simple kinds of control principles to reestablish your control. The first is, if a witness starts to give you a long answer, do not jump on them and hold up your hand and yell at them and say, stop, I didn't ask you that. Just answer the question yes or no. When you do that, you look like you have been hurt. And you look like you've lost your control. And so much better to simply keep your cool when a witness goes off and to simply repeat your question. Officer Sloviak, you left the scene of the Thompson residence at 1030. Well, yes, of course. We knew that. That's where the, where the boarding house was, and we were afraid he was going to take off and run, and so we tried to get there as soon as we could. Officer Sliviak, let me repeat my question. You left there at 10.30 in the evening. By simply repeating the question that you've asked, you're able to now bring the jury back to your point and show the officer is not really answering the question that you've asked. So try that. Try just the simple repeat of your question to reestablish control. You might, in fact, do a reverse repeat if you find that you're getting too much of a quarrel. Officer Sloviak, I'm sorry, are you saying you didn't leave at 10.30 on the evening of Leslie Mitchell's death? By reverse repeating, you similarly have the opportunity to restate your point and get the witness back into your area. Now, after that, you might take the gloves off a little bit more, but you've shown yourself willing to be patient, to restate your questions. You know, the ability to restate your questions depends on your first question being as tight and one fact as can be. And so if you found your ask, yourself asking too much, if you've said, for example, well, you've only stayed there 15 minutes. Well, and Officer Soviak might say, well, in the circumstances, it wasn't only. It was sufficient for what we needed to do. And then your repeat can't be, well, you only stay there 15 minutes. Your repeat is going to be cleaner and leaner. And it'll be, you stayed 15 minutes before you left for the boarding house. So take the wiggle words out of the question, keep them tight, and that'll allow you to baby step the witness along. You might, if you need to, put your hand up if the witness launches after you've done this a couple of times. 
but I would never still ask the court for help or try to get the judge, judge to, enlist, to or, or try to, by, by interrupting the witness, show that you're afraid of what the witness has to say. Your attitude in control should always be, members of the jury, once you hear my facts, you'll realize and agree with the conclusions that I'm looking for you to, for, to reach. So don't quarrel with them, don't lose your cool, don't lose your patience. Just stay patient, repeat your questions, use a reverse repeat, and simply stay on the task, keeping your questions as tight as you can do. So some control suggestions for you in case things get, get run. Now as you think about your cross-examinations, if you follow some of these principles, you'll have the success experience that I, I'm sure that you're looking for here. You, it takes some work. It takes some detailed resource work to make sure you source your questions and your facts in as tight a way as you can, either in the record or in, in bulletproof logic. Try to stay away from the one question too many. Don't argue your point. Save it for closing. And if you follow these simple rules of one fact per question, baby steps, announced by a topic, then the jury is going to reach the conclusion before you need to tell them about it. And when you get to closing, your job is to then remind them of the conclusions that they've already reached for themselves. Thank you.